Hello everyone and welcome back to another installment from our series Straight from the Horse's Mouth. Today's webinar centres on a life cycle assessment which compares the sustainability performance of green shell mussels and Pacific oysters farmed in New Zealand with other sources of dietary protein. Here's a sneak preview. But the value of a life cycle assessment for us is that it's definitive scientific evidence of our carbon footprint. It validates our claims in a scientific way of being one of the lowest impact, low carbon sources of protein. What we found is that the frozen, frozen half shell product has the lowest environmental footprint. And that might come as slightly surprising because you have to freeze it first. But the freezing has a benefit of reducing waste in the downstream supply chain. If products are air freighted, we recommend focusing on packaging. So trying to lightweight, make the, the packaging as lightweight and as compact as possible, and also focusing on nearer markets where it's possible. We've set some quite challenging goals ourselves around emissions reductions, those being uh, a 25% reduction in absolute emissions by 2030. Uh, and that's off a 2020 baseline. We're a result of the uh, settlement with the, with the Crown and we manage the commercial fisheries assets on behalf of Māori. We've got a, a goal to be producing 2 million dozen oysters by 2026. We've got a, a target of um, to be carbon neutral by 2040 and so absolute reductions is our first um, step. So that study helps, helps with that. The LCA was used to assess the carbon footprint of farmed shellfish over their entire life cycle. This included the various stages of farming, harvesting, processing, packaging, chilled distribution to domestic retail, preparing, consumption and the disposal of used shells and packaging. With that, let's get started. Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, A More Sustainable Shellfish Industry, How LCA is Helping. This webinar is part of our regular series, Straight from the Horse's Mouth, Insights from Experts in 30 Minutes. Uh, today we've got a few extra experts, so we're Insights from Experts in 45 Minutes, plus possibly a little more if we run over time. Uh, my name is Jeff Vickers, I'm Technical Director at ThinkStep ANZ, and I have the pleasure of hosting you for the next 45 minutes plus. So in terms of order of today's session, uh, Steph Hopkins from Aquaculture New Zealand will be leading us in followed by myself and Sam Womit and my colleague talking about the results of the study. We'll then go to Peter Longdill from Sanford. And finally, uh, not Emmanuel from uh, Moana, but instead Michelle Turrington from Moana who's stepping in on behalf of Emmanuel for today. So with that, I'd like to hand across to our first speaker, Steph Hopkins, the Policy Manager at Aquaculture New Zealand, to talk to us about the goal of the study, why it was conducted and give us a bit of background. Over to you, Steph. Kia ora koutou, uh, everybody. I'm Steph Hopkins uh, with Aquaculture New Zealand, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of aquaculture and why we wanted to get involved in the life cycle assessment study. So firstly, a quick summary of aquaculture in New Zealand. So our industry is centred around the farming of three main species, that's green shell mussels, Pacific oysters and king salmon. Our products are renowned as being nutritionally rich, so they're good for you and they're farmed sustainably. Aquaculture is farmed the length of New Zealand, from the top of the north down to Stewart Island. The industry generates income, jobs and opportunities, particularly in our smaller towns and regions where farming is located. We generate about $650 million in revenue each year through domestic and export sales, with products exported to over 70 countries. In fact, green shell mussels was New Zealand's most valuable seafood export in 2020. We're proud that Māori participation and ownership within the industry is significant and it's growing. It is hardwired through the Crown's delivery of aquaculture settlement assets to iwi. Aquaculture can be seen as a means of enhancing iwi prosperity for future generations. Sustainability is a fundamental tenet of aquaculture in New Zealand. We've developed the A-plus sustainable management framework to help New Zealand farmers measure and improve their environmental performance across a whole range of criteria Things like um, ecology, water quality, food safety, waste, and say community engagement, for example. And the industry has huge potential to grow in the coming years to meet global demand. So in terms of growth, very briefly, in 2019, the New Zealand government released an aquaculture strategy for the sector. So it's a plan for the sustainable growth of the industry. So the key pillar that's relevant to today's discussion is the sustainability outcome, whereby ensuring that our industry is world leading in its environmental sustainability practices. And it actually includes the objective, partner with industry on a transition plan to reduce emissions and waste across the value chain. So why would we care about life cycle assessment? 
So as you know, there's growing awareness of the effects of our choices and our actions on the environment. Increasingly, consumers are prepared to change their shopping habits to minimise their carbon footprint associated with their purchases. So this is driving uh, conscious consumer demand for lower carbon products and services, and businesses are having to respond to these changes by measuring and reducing their impacts and sharing this with their customers. Now, big companies and sectors are getting on board. So, for example, the multinational Unilever has embedded carbon footprint measures into their sustainability reporting and are actively decarbonising their business. Close to home, New Zealand wine was the first in the world over 10 years ago to display carbon emissions per individual glass of Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, uh, which, by the way, pairs beautifully with our seafood. Other sectors in New Zealand, like the building and construction sectors and the red meat, are also measuring their emissions. So the aquaculture industry want to be on the front foot in this space. We want to be proving our environmental credentials to our consumers. Step one was understanding our emissions profile. So we already knew that our shellfish were an environmentally friendly, low impact, great choice. Shellfish are filter feeders, so they take what they need to grow from the waters that they've grown in by filtering out phytoplankton, ensuring that they've got a really light touch on the environment. But the value of a life cycle assessment for us is that it's definitive scientific evidence of our carbon footprint. It validates our claims in a scientific way of being one of the lowest impact, low carbon sources of protein. We seize the opportunity, therefore, to partner with MPI and ThinkStep to undertake the study, to better understand our emissions and the areas we can improve. And we appreciate that it's the full life cycle that's in scope, so not just the direct emissions, and it included an expert peer review, making it a really credible piece of work for us. The findings will allow us to deepen our engagement with a whole range of stakeholders around um, conversations around our environmental effects, including with central government, uh, regional councils who are responsible for regulating and managing marine farms in our regions uh, with the community and environmental interest groups, for example. Um, and it will also build onto our existing A plus environmental management program. And it really aligns with the values in that program around research and continual improvement. It's going to be a really positive contribution to our current and future activities in that space. And we're also really aware of the high level context in New Zealand where the New Zealand government responded to the global climate crisis with our own Climate Change Response Act, including setting in legislation the goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So we want to be well positioned to respond to changes that might be required of us in future. So for all these reasons, we were really keen to be part of a life cycle assessment for farm shellfish. Great. All right. So I wanted to jump in and talk about the kind of goal and scope of the study and the results. And then I'll hand over to my colleague, Sam, who was the lead author of the study, and he'll take you through a bit more of the detail. In terms of what we want to cover, it's goals, it's what we found, it's how does it compare and providing some ultimate conclusions and recommendations. So for any life cycle assessment study, the most important part is defining the goal and scope. What are we trying to achieve and how are we going to get there? The first thing we wanted to do was to quantify the environmental performance of farm shellfish in New Zealand so that we could sh show something back to the growers, to the processors that they have something that sort of gives them the hotspots and identify where the sort of impacts lie. So that was our second goal, that hotspot piece. And the third goal was really around how that compares. So I think the ch challenge always with carbon footprinting, with life cycle assessment, is you come out the other end of the tunnel, it takes you a while to get there, and then you say, okay, the carbon footprint's seven. And you say, well, that's really interesting, but is seven good or bad? And so in this context, it's sort of putting that into the perspective of other forms of food, and we needed a way to do that. And so because we've got kind of a couple of different goals here, we actually measured things in different ways. So for the growers, for the processors, we put things in terms of kilograms of shellfish meat, shellfish flesh, um, because that's a meaningful unit in terms of what you buy and what you sell. Um, but for the comparison to different forms of protein and different food products, we actually had to find another unit. And so we used a unit called, well, a unit of 100 grams of protein to allow us to make comparisons to other food sources. Keeping in mind that, you know, protein is not the only nutritional benefit from shellfish and they are nutritionally rich foods and provide a lot of other benefits. So what we were doing, as Steph said, was we're looking at the full life cycle. We were looking at farm shellfish from ocean to plate. So we looked right from the production of the early stage stuff, the spat, right through to the point that the product is consumed and the shelves are disposed of. We covered farming, processing, packaging, food preparation, disposal, use, uh, and disposal of the used shells. 
So this is just another way of visualizing what I just said. Um, the, the per kilogram numbers that I'm going to present first, they focus on this full life cycle. But when we go later on in the presentation to, to the comparisons comparing to other forms of protein, it's just this top part here from what we call cradle to retail, like the start of the life cycle, right from the, the initial sort of inception of the shellfish in the ocean, right to the point of you know, delivery to a, to a retailer, to a supermarket. Um, and the reason for that is just that that's what the other studies that we're referencing against that's the scope that they used. They didn't use a cradle to grave scope. So just to keep in mind, when you're seeing the results, two different scopes, one is one kilogram of a shellfish meat covering the full life cycle. And another is hundred grams of dietary protein just from uh, the production in the sea right through to the retailer. So our scope included farmed New Zealand green shell mussels and farmed Pacific oysters. Uh, we have uh, the two largest producers on this call today, which is great to have them both. So Sanford is the largest producer of green shell mussels in New Zealand and Moana is the largest producer of Pacific oysters. And um, what we looked at was a range of different environmental indicators. We looked at carbon footprint, acidification, which is, you know, contributes to acid rain and acidifying waterways, eutrophication, which you most commonly see through algal blooms in freshwater, for example, um, and summer smog, which is an, a, a measure of, you know, pollution caused by well, photochemical ozone, a very sort of sexy term there, but sort of emissions from power plants and vehicles that cause uh, that sort of haze you see on the horizon in large cities. And um, what we found was that basically, if we look at different products, so this is one kilogram of mussel meat, and I'll go to oyster meat in a second. What we found is that the frozen, frozen half shell product has the lowest environmental footprint. And that might come as slightly surprising because you have to freeze it first, but the freezing has a benefit of reducing waste in the downstream supply chain. So if you freeze something, Firstly, uh, you're not really wasting much of it because you can store it for a long period of time. So there's very little downstream waste. So you don't have to produce more to, to recover from the part that you wasted. And secondly, um, it allows you to actually transport the product over a long distance if you wish to. So while this is New Zealand um, consumption, we also did a range of other studies looking at export. And in that case, the, the frozen half shell product really outperforms all of the other formats just because of the fact it can go in a boat and it's not time critical to get to the final market. Here you can see the live product in the potted meat offer slightly higher environmental footprint, slightly higher carbon footprint. You can see part of the reason for that with the live product is the packaging. Uh, that's partly because of the fact that you've got a full shell, you can't stack it as tightly, you've got a more complicated packaging set up to keep the product fresh and alive. And so, you know, you have a more, more packaging required and you also have more loss in the downstream uh, chain as well. So you can see this distribution waste bar pops up here, whereas it's effectively negligible here. And so it's just a difference in that sort of downstream chain where you don't have the waste, you have to produce fewer sort of shellfish as a result, and you don't have as much packaging. So ultimately the, the frozen half shell is the most efficient. If we go to oysters, you see a very similar sort of a picture. The actual numbers here have changed, and I can talk about that in a second, but the overall picture isn't fundamentally different. Um, what you can see in the case of oysters is these numbers have gone up relative to mussels. And the reason is just that this is per kilogram of meat. Um, Mussels have a higher meat to shell uh, ratio than oysters. There's more shell in an oyster relative to the amount of meat you get out. And as a result, that affects the kind of overall life cycle performance. One thing you can see here at the bottom of these charts, these blue parts, the cross-hatched area and the solid blue, this is the farming impacts. The cross-hatched bit represents direct emissions from the shellfish growing in the water. And I'll talk about that in a second. So this is something that the growers can do absolutely nothing about. And it's just something due to ocean chemistry. Um, but we can kind of cover that in a sec. But overall, what you see is a very similar picture with the frozen half shell performing the best, live and potted meat performing a little bit worse, but overall not, not too bad. One of the interesting findings from the study is that I think there's a perception among many people that because shellfish shells are made of calcium carbonate, that they should absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And I think that's a reasonable assumption or conclusion to sort of draw from, from looking at that. But what we found through doing a fair amount of research into this area is that ocean chemistry is quite complex. And depending on where you are, you get these quite complex buffer reactions occurring. And so through the, you can, you know, and what this is showing is that basically through, you know, to produce the calcium carbonate in the shell, you actually release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So it's actually direct production of carbon dioxide, firstly into the water and then ultimately into the atmosphere. But these uh, relationships are very complex and probably not as well understood as things on land. 
And this is probably an area that could be further explored in future. Through the study, what we tried to do was to be as conservative as possible um, and take the worst case wherever we could so that we potentially overestimate impacts with the view that better research will hopefully uh, reduce them over time. How does all of that compare? Just as a reminder, what we're looking at here is not the full life cycle anymore, but rather just cradle to retail or production to retail. And what you can see here is oysters and mussels taking the unit of 100 grams of protein and looking at the carbon footprint of each. So what we're saying is for mussels, the carbon footprint is 1.8 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per 100 grams of protein. So that's not the live flesh anymore. That's maybe, you know, a kilogram of meat or a kilogram of mussels or whatever it happens to be that turns out to be that, that amount of protein. So what you can see on that basis is that mussels and oysters are performing as well or better than any of the other animal derived proteins that you can see here. You can see beef, lamb, they're in the order of 50, 20, et cetera. And oysters and mussels are really down around tofu. They're a bit higher than nuts and, and pulses and things. So your, your chickpeas and lentils and, and things, but they're pretty low on the overall scale of things. And that shows they're a very low carbon um, protein source. One of the comments that we've got a lot on this chart is regarding whether these, you know, what these numbers mean and how they compare in the New Zealand context. And what I did just want to point out is that this is world average data. So these numbers are not New Zealand production for New Zealand consumption. We're comparing to a study that was an international study done by two authors, Paul and Nemechek. Um, it looked at total production of products delivered to the local market in the world and looked at the full range of variables that might affect the efficiency of production. So what you can see here is this is the average, this 50 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per 100 grams, but you can see a very large bar here that you can see for beef in particular. What this bar shows is this is the 10th percentile down here, and this arrow that's way off the chart, I think at about 105 kilograms of CO2 equivalent is the 90th percentile for beef. Um, New Zealand beef and lamb, they actually perform down here at the 10th percentile or even a bit lower. The reason being that uh, we outdoor rear our beef and lamb and they're grass fed. They're not stored in, you know, um, barns over winter where they need to be heated. They're not fed huge amounts of imported feed. They're eating mostly grass and hay and they're eating it and living outside. And as a result, that has a significant benefit for their carbon footprint, but even still the conclusions remain the same. So even if you're down here at the lower end of the, the beef and lamb spectrum, you're still above oysters and mussels. And I think what this shows is that regardless of where you're buying the product, you've got a good outcome for the, the oysters and mussels in terms of their carbon footprint. So just to make that point. So I want to hand over now to Sam to talk about the detailed results. So Sam, over to you. Um, so yeah, the charts that Jeff showed before looked at uh, only domestically consumed shellfish. Um, and we also wanted to get an idea with the study as to how this is different for exported um, oysters and mussels. So this graph shows the domestic production. On this slide, um, we show the export value mussels on the left and oysters on the right. And as you can see that the majority of um, shellfish products by volume exported out of New Zealand uh, is frozen, with probably the most uh, notable exception to this being a significant amount of live oyster shell, uh, live oyster products being um, exported as well. And this was based on um, HNZ data from 2019. And so this slide looks at the carbon footprint of frozen shellfish products going to different markets. The nearest market is usually one of the Pacific Islands and the furthest market um, is usually somewhere in Europe. Uh, and then we've also got a sales weighted average uh, down there as well. Uh, this is for, yeah, for both oysters and mussels. One of the key things we'd like to take away from this is that for frozen products, it doesn't usually matter if they're exported or not. It increases the carbon footprint due to the food miles, the travel that they have to take to get to that market, but it's not a huge um, increase in the carbon footprint. Um, and this is because cargo ships are relatively efficient at exporting um, products because they can contain a large amount of um, products at once and it impacts the split between all of them. Sweet. Um, so this looks at the carbon footprint of live shellfish exported. Again, we've got the nearest and the furthest export markets, as well as the export average um, sales weighted. Um, and this graph is quite different to the frozen products because the, these live products are exported overseas by air freight, which has a significantly higher carbon footprint than by sea freight. And as you can see in this graph, the increase in the 
life cycle impacts of these products increases by a factor of about seven, um, depending on the product. And so this is quite significant. And this is one of our findings that we had in our report that exporting life products is a significant increase on the carbon footprint. Love to go into more detail, I guess, but we've got um, limited time. So I'll hand back to Jeff. So just to just to wrap up in terms of key outcomes from the study. So just wanted to sort of summarize shellfish are a low carbon food source. So that's what the study is showing. It's saying they're really there at the same level as, you know, tofu, for example, one of the most common plant-based proteins in the world. I think that's a great outcome to be able to talk about. Shellfish do have the lowest carbon footprint of all animal, animal products that we studied in this, uh, in this particular study. Um, and the carbon footprint of farm mussels is comparable to tofu, as, as I mentioned. Uh, as Sam just highlighted, putting shellfish in a plane can have a potentially significant effect on the carbon footprint and can increase impact by a factor of about 7 to 10, depending on the product. In terms of what we recommend as an outcome from this study, um, if products are air freighted, we recommend focusing on packaging. So trying to lightweight, make the, the packaging as lightweight and as compact as possible. And also focusing on nearer markets where it's possible. So where it's possible to sell more to the Pacific Islands, to Australia, to the west coast of the US, to nearer Asian markets, that's gonna have a lower footprint than air freighting longer distance. Um, it will be worth encouraging air cargo operators to explore low carbon fuels, although that's a very long-term play. In terms of what producers can do themselves, I think on farm, there's the ability to switch vessels uh, and, and vehicles to more renewables. So whether a truck's used, there's the opportunity potentially to use biofuels. Uh, the same thing for barges, you know, that are currently using petrol or diesel or whatever it happens to be, there's the opportunity to move to biofuels there as well. It may not be immediate, but there will be the opportunity in the nearer, near to medium term. In terms of processing, I think there's still quite a bit of fossil fuel used in the processing plants because of where they're sited. And um, that's not universally true, but it can be. And there's an opportunity there to switch to either, you know, biomass or electric boilers potentially. There's also an opportunity for live products to look at reusable packaging in the New Zealand market, but that's unlikely to work internationally. Uh, and in terms of, you know, uh, something that's a little bit beyond the scope of the study, but one of the key drivers for consumers, consumers are very concerned about uh, plastics in the oceans and rightly so. And so I think there's the, you know, a recommend more general recommendation to innovate in ocean contact materials, just with how we deal with and manage plastics that are in contact with the ocean. Finally, I'd like to pay a special thanks to our funding organisations. So this work was co-funded by Aquaculture New Zealand, Steph on the call, and also Fisheries New Zealand, which is part of Ministry for Primary Industries. I'd like to acknowledge our expert review panel, Sarah McLaren from uh, Massey University, Frederica Ziegler from um, Research Institutes of Sweden, and Anna Farmery from the University of Wollongong in Australia. And if you would like to find out more about the study, um, you can do so on our website. If you go to thinkstepanz.com, click Insights and then Case Studies, You'll find the full report, a short summary report, and the media release. With that, I'd like to hand over to our next speaker, Peter. So a bit of an introduction to Sanford. Um, we have our origins in the 1800s with our founder, Albert Sanford. We're now uh, New Zealand's largest uh, and oldest uh, seafood company. Sanford operate across uh, both the wild catch and the aquaculture sectors. So that's both inshore fresh uh, wild catch, deep water frozen at sea, uh, and on the aquaculture side uh, with both the green shell mussels and the king salmon uh, species. Uh, in terms of scale of workforce, it's 1,409 people who are all, I guess, specialists in their particular um, element of our uh, process to harvest, process, and then sell uh, beautiful New Zealand seafood. Footprint across the country, we've got 225 aquaculture farms. The mussel farms are geographically spread from Great Barrier Island in the north uh, all the way down through the country to Stewart Island in the south. Uh, and we've got salmon operations focused down in uh, Southland and Stewart Island as well. Um, last year, Sanford harvested around 30,000 tonnes of green shell mussels and around 4,900 tonnes of king salmon. Across all of our operations, um, the seafood that was harvested was sufficient to provide for around 774 million meals. Now, in terms of um, why we got into and why we supported this uh, life cycle assessment study, um, at, a, at a macro level, when we look at the, um, the sort of the global population and demand for food, we see uh, forecasts of quite significant population growth globally, up to around 9 to 10 billion people 
on the planet by 2050. Uh, we also see a trend of uh, dietary shifts towards lower impact foods and food production systems. Uh, and we believe that aquaculture has a huge role to play in meeting the nutrition needs uh, for that growing population and that shift, those shifting global diets. The green shell mussel in particular, we think has a, is a real um, key part of that story and can contribute to that substantially. At a, specifically at a, at a business level, um, of course, like a lot of other businesses, we've become very aware of the challenges that uh, climate change is going to bring uh, all of society and our business in through the future. Uh, we're experiencing some of those effects already uh, in terms of water temperatures and, and uh, algal blooms, rainfall events, storm events affecting some of the farms. And I guess as a, as a response on the emissions reductions side, we've set some quite challenging goals ourselves around emissions reductions, those being uh, a 25% reduction in absolute emissions by 2030. And um, that's off a 2020 baseline. Um, that's aligned with a, a well below one and a half degrees, oh, sorry, well below two degrees uh, warming scenario. And on an intensity basis, that equates across our product mix to an emissions reduction of 59% across that same time period. We've got a number of internal projects to, to drive that and, and try and achieve that goal. But beyond just our own operations, we certainly believe that in a uh, we have ability to contribute in a wider sense to um, those shifting diets and and lower impact food systems through those you know light touch and low carbon um, food delivery uh, out to the market. So this study certainly um, feeds into that. We also, I guess, think that. These green shell mussels, you know, like a, we think they're really delicious uh, and we want the world to know about them and, and, and about how great they are, not only their low impact, but the benefits they can bring. So that's our motivation. We're, we're super uh, supportive of the study uh, and glad to have been part of it. I'd next like to hand over to our, uh, our final speaker, um, Michelle Terrington from Moana. So Michelle's kindly offered to step in for Emmanuel from Moana, who's uh, been called away on some urgent uh, work today. So over to you. Kia ora, Michelle. Thank you for the introduction. First, um, I just want to apologise on behalf of um, Emmanuel that he was called called away. Um, so today you have you have me, um, So I just wanted to start by giving an introduction um, into who Moana New Zealand is. We're a hundred percent iwi owned organisation. We're a result of the uh, settlement with the, with the Crown and we manage the commercial fisheries assets on behalf of Māori. We employ around 320 people across the country. Um, we've got eight processing facilities, um, two here in Auckland, one in uh, Coromandel, which is a, an oyster processing facility, Whangaroa, Wellington and Nelson. Um, in terms of our products, um, in Ruakaka, we farm Pawa Kahurangi, or um, blue abalone. Uh, we harvest uh, Pawa Tua, or wild abalone, from around the, around the country. Our quota, um, or lobster quota, goes through a, um, a joint venture through Port Nicholson Fisheries. Um, and then we've got a number of oyster farms in the far north and top of the south. We're also producers of um, shelf-stable, ready-to-eat um, meals and we also operate um, within the inshore uh, fisheries industry. So specifically when it comes to our um, oyster part of the business we've got 105 employees um, and we process 1.2 million dozen oysters uh, last year. We've got a, a goal to be producing 2 million dozen oysters by 2026. Uh, the formats that we process in are both um, frozen half shell and live and to a lesser extent some uh, chilled product on the domestic market. Um, our oyster farms are right across the far north um, and processing facilities in both um, Auckland, Woody, um, and, and the Coromandel. And then in Nelson, we've got um, both a hatchery and uh, a nursery, and we also do a little bit of grow out too on the top of, top of the South Island. One of the benefits of having a fully integrated business right from um, a breeding program through to um, you know, the hatchery and the nursery, 
through to farming processing and then um, sending it out to market is our ability to enact change. Um, so we have greater control, particularly when it comes to some of the actions um, coming out of this study. And so when it comes to this life cycle assessment study from Wana, we were supportive of it because it aligns with our with our values. One of our values is kaishiakitanga, um, which is, you know, custodians for future generations. It also um, aligned with our growth strategy. So we know that what we're producing is uh, high in protein, but low, low impact um, on the environment. It's a, you know, so the, our carbon um, journey has just begun from Wana. So over the last of, I guess, um, 15 or so months, we've been measuring our carbon footprint and we've actually gone back over the last three years to make sure we've got um, quite a solid baseline. We're now looking at, um, you know, what does that reduction strategy look like for the for the business? And this study has helped um, build awareness internally around some of the things that, um, so that we can be looking at, particularly as the um, live market is growing in demand in our export market. So we've got some things that we need to be thinking about, which the study has helped us, um, helped guide our thinking. And you know, packaging is one of those things Jeff was saying earlier around, um, you know, packaging, packaging being quite, um, quite a big component. So we can be looking at that and we can also be looking at the freight, you know, our operations are, are right across the country. So looking at how we can be more strategic and, and around, the, around the movements and transport internally as we're, uh, as we're growing out. Yeah, so just, those are just kind of a couple of examples of um, some of the practical things that we can do as a business um, as a result of this um, study and, and how it helps build awareness internally about the things, uh, you know, the components that make up um, the carbon footprint of, of a delicious oyster. And that's all for me, thanks. So we now have some time for a panel discussion where we can answer any questions you may have. And I might start out with a couple that have already been asked. So the first one that we have is quite a technical one. And I just I should probably start by acknowledging all of our speakers again. So thank you all for your presentations, much appreciated. Um, the first question comes from Adam and he asked, have similar life cycle systems been done elsewhere in the world? And if so, did they get similar results? So perhaps, um, Sam, I might hand over to you and bring up this really complicated chart that we weren't hoping to show, but now we're going to be bringing up, uh, which was saved in the back. Um, would you be able to talk to this just regarding the shellfish? And then maybe we can talk more generally about shellfish versus other species um, after that. Yeah, this chart, as Jeff mentioned, shows a bit of a comparison based on per 100 grams of protein across different products. Um, this was quite difficult for some studies because we had to convert from their various units. They might have had dozens or kilos, et cetera. So we had to make some conversions with that, but we're pretty happy with what we've got. And you can see there's a fair range in terms of the impacts between um, all the mussel products and all the oyster products. Um, but over as an absolute number, they're not too different. And you can see that the most for the oysters is 2.3 kilograms of CO2 and then the least is 0.26, fairly high in terms of um, relative, but absolute not so much. One other thing is that these studies also, there's a wide amount, a range of production methods. Oysters and mussels are quite low impact generally, but some of these, I think from memory, were like hand farms, basically someone walking out into picking them. And so there's quite a range in production methods as well. Another thing to note that um, Jeff mentioned with the shell chemistry in terms of the creation of the shell um, forming carbon calcium carbonate actually releases carbon dioxide. Uh, none of the studies that we looked at um, followed this as well because the study that we based our work on was released on in 2018. And so most of these studies were actually published before this. Um, and so you can see the dot on those yellow bars which show our study's results. Those dots show the results of our study without including that direct release of um, uh, carbon dioxide during the formation of the shell. And so that's probably a more um, comparable number to look at these. And you can see that those are a bit more aligned with some of those other uh, readings you got there. Um, and also you can see there are two lines at the top and bottom, and they looked at um, the upper and lower quartiles of uh, meta-analyses by of mollusks by Dorhausen University. And you can see that most of the, these studies, or almost all of these studies, are within that range. And also I'd point out that as well, that the topper quartile of this um, range is also lower than the lowest um, animal product 
uh, which in the poor metric study, which was eggs, I think it was about the same as eggs, but lower than all the other ones. I think it's, it's clear from this graph that you're showing, and I think your explanation that doing that, uh, comparing with other studies very quickly becomes incredibly um, detailed and complicated because of variations in scope of assessment, uh, units of measure, categorization of what you're talking about, right? Shellfish as a grouping can include both mollusks like mo mussels and oysters, but it can also include shrimp, uh, which is a very different sort of um, production method and, and emissions uh, footprint. So unless you are taking quite careful consideration of all those things between the studies, um, yeah, you can quickly get lost, I think. So it's a, it does become very difficult and complicated. Our results do line up with the wider picture internationally. Yeah, and, and maybe just in terms of the comparison to other proteins, I mean, it, it is relatively widely known that shellfish perform well because as Steph opened up with, they are filter feeders. You don't have an external feed source to provide them with. That is a significant benefit, you know, for a lot of other, you know, other form of animal protein, a, a large portion of the impact is in the feed. And without the feed, you know, you do have a, a much, much better impact profile, which becomes much more comparable to plants um, because it's more than in the harvesting and processing that you have the impact. We have added this impact in the ocean, but I would add that oceans are an understudied part of the world and the ocean chemistry equations that we've relied on are complicated and rely quite heavily on local ocean chemistry, acidities, salinity, temperature, all kinds of different parameters. I'd say there's a lot more work to be done there. And maybe that ties into a question that Catherine has raised. Will this issue regarding carbon sequestration and carbon releases be further researched in New Zealand? And what are the key inquiry areas moving forward as a result of this? Does anyone want to answer that or try to answer that? I'd have a stab in saying that um, I am aware, although I'm not, not sure of the details, but we can certainly um, probably go back and find out a bit more and, and, and clarify if we need to. But that there's um, some ongoing work looking at the um, the ability of both the um, both the farming of shellfish and also the farming of seaweeds to sequester carbon. So um, that's kind of an emerging space at this point, and um, so it is on on our radar. But um, in terms of the, the more detail around the research aims, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, and maybe I should just point out that through this work, we did do a little bit of work together with, um, we were in contact with some people at NIWA and some people at the Cawthorn Institute. There are others out there who are working in this area. I think there's, there's definitely a lot of open questions here. And I think there's a lot more room for further research. And we do think that by looking at this further, we might actually be able to pull these numbers down a bit. We tried to be quite conservative and if we could overstate the significance of these numbers. So more research would hopefully bring the figures down even further, which would make the comparison even better. Uh, that was our intention, that we try to be conservative, but you know, you're know, you dealing with a fair amount of uncertainty, so we tried the best we could. So I'd say there's, there's open questions there. Um, there's another question from Frederick reg regarding interactions in the environment, and he asks, um, you know, we're told that mussels and oysters are, you know, are filter feeders and they're filtering thousands of litres of seawater and cleaning and removing pollutants. What is the significance of, of that and how does that affect, you know, other things happening in the ocean in terms of concentrations of pollutants, heavy metals, microplastics, and, you know, and, and does that affect the, the safeness of these things to eat and what are the interactions kind of with the environment? I don't know if anyone wants to tackle that, maybe Peter? It probably is worth saying there's, you know, where mussels are harvested from, and I'll speak for mussels in particular, where they're harvested from is, is quite carefully controlled in terms of, the water quality in the area prior to harvest. Um, and we've faced uh, at times, you know, real challenges of not being able to harvest in particular areas due to heavy rainfall events. Uh, so essentially that the mussels sit in the water and you wait for the uh, uh, for that rainfall event to go through uh, the system to flush out um, and then you're basically good to go again. So that is something that's on the radar um, including these other things with, you know, talking about microplastics, there's ongoing investigations from um, ESR uh, into, into some of that and, and, and looking into researching and seeing what, what, uh, what might be present in the water bodies. So we're, we're certainly a part of that. Um, uh, 
So it's an ongoing sort of uh, part of an area of investigation, but the, the quality of, of the food is also carefully controlled in terms of, you know, what's in the, uh, what's in the um, production system and uh, the this, this sampling and analysis going on all the time. It's, a, it's an actual government regulated scheme called the Biovalve Molluscan Shellfish Regulated Control Scheme. So um, it's a really robust framework that means that we're able to um, farm and um, harvest and export products, um, our, any, of our, any of our bivalve products, so shellfish, um, mussels and oysters, may, um, so ensuring that they're safe to eat. Um, so I think you'd um, have confidence um, both domestically and in the export markets that our shellfish are very safe to eat. Um, and again, I reiterate what Peter said in terms of microplastics. So plastics is an area that we are actively looking at in terms of reducing our plastic waste across aquaculture. Um, microplastics is really challenging because um, we're potentially both the source of microplastics, but also um, potentially having it um, accumulate or um, be present, sorry, rather, within our, uh, within our shellfish at very, very low levels. Um, but there's just not enough information right now to, um, to really be able to um, say, say a lot further, except that there's research underway. That's a good point. I also, I guess I'd point out that, you know, microplastic pollution isn't unique to just in the sea. You know, we've also got huge problems with land-based agriculture. Um, and so I think that's an emerging area that requires a lot more careful study and thought. Um, there's a specific follow-up question from Simon. Um, he mentions, Peter, you said that there are issues around algal blooms, but I believe there can also be issues regarding the waste that collects under mussel farms. Are there strategies to reduce the nutrients and what is being done to manage algal blooms? Okay, I guess mussels, mussel farms would probably be a net uh, sink of nutrients rather than a, a source. Um, so I wonder if, if in terms of the benthic effect, if there might be something to do there with a uh, potentially a different species. Um, you know, underneath a mussel farm, you are going to find, you know, there's mussels that drop off the ropes and there's uh, uh, off the lines and there's seaweeds that might drop off. There's been quite a number of studies, not necessarily done by, by us, but in the, in the published literature, and there was a really good review of them done by the Nature Conservancy just last year around the actual ecosystem effect of long line mussel culture, which is, which is how they're all cultured essentially in New Zealand. And that actually found there was an increase in both diversity and abundance of species around the cultured the, the mussel farm so it was actually having i think it was a 1.1 times increase in abundance of species and about a 3.6 times increase in the abundance of uh, in the diversity of species um, and certainly i know there's a lot of, of a lot of fishermen around that will certainly attest to that these things are, are hotbeds for your fishermen when they go out uh, you know looking to, to sort of get their catch there are a couple of um, regions around New Zealand that are actually looking at um, uh, spreading mus live mussels and mussel shell on the seafloor to, um, to, I guess, uh, enhance the biodiversity and also try and restore natural mussel beds. So that's ongoing in the Firth of Thames and in the Marlborough Sounds. So um, again, further evidence of the benefits of, uh, of mussels to an ecosystem. And yeah, maybe just building on that as well, one of, one of the things we did look into a little bit in the study, but not in any great detail, was the ability to put shells back into the ocean after consumption and what they would have on from a carbon footprint point of view. And if the ocean is acidic enough, then the, then the reaction flips the other way and the carbon dioxide is absorbed rather than being released. And so the Firth of Thames is one location where it would make sense to, to put the shells um, from a carbon perspective as well as from a, providing an ecosystem perspective. So I think there's there's a lot of further work to be done there. I mean, there's a, there's a comment here, which from an anonymous uh, attendee that asks, it, or it's a question, I should say, is there going to be another life cycle assessment study, you know, beyond carbon that takes into account both the positive environmental impacts like water filtration and any major negative environmental impacts like marine plastic pollution from aquaculture farming? I'll have a crack and then you, you can... Um you can come in with something a lot more sensible than what I'm about to say. Um, I, I guess I would say that um, from a collective industry perspective, we that's kind of where we see the A plus environmental program sitting. So um, it's about taking a really broad view of our environmental performance as an industry and looking across a whole lot of different criteria. Um, and so 
uh, yeah, I guess we're, we've been considering um, whether we have, for example, like a, a dashboard or something that could report annually um, across a, a few of the key metrics. So we, we do release our um, A plus sustainability report each year that picks out a few of the key metrics and, um, and puts them into context and gives you some, some of the, um, the more interesting stuff that's going on in the industry. So, but I'm not sure entirely in terms of technical, um, a, a technical assessment that would look beyond carbon um, at, some of these, at some of these other things. Jeff, have you got um, any sort of more te technical yeah. uh, things to add? I have a few thoughts, and I think um, one of them is so the, the last question we did did actually include multiple indicators, and one of them was regarding eutrophication, which is nutrient flows. And in the first version of the study we did, we actually included a, a net benefit from um, both mussels and oysters because of the fact that they're filtering out um, uh, you know, nu excess nutrients from the water, so they can actually have a positive effect on eutrophication. Um, we eventually removed that because the particular method that we used didn't really support that positive and negative um, flows, the flows moving in both directions. But I think there's work that could be done there to look at the, the net benefits. So I think that could be better considered. I mean, one of the other things we talked a lot through the development of the study was also about like multi-trophic aquaculture and the ability for these things to all link together, you know, seaweed and shellfish and fish all together and forming little mini ecosystems and the benefits of that, because, um, you know, these sorts of uh, farms can be also fish aggregation, you know, there can be fish aggregation devices and create their own kind of micro or micro ecosystems. Those things were kind of out of the scope of the study because it starts to get quite tricky about where you draw the boundary. Um, but I think they are really important. There's, I think there's a lot more work that could be done there. In terms of plastics, that's an issue for life cycle assessment uh, and life cycle impact assessment more generally. So there's quite a lot of work being done at the moment to incorporate plastics and microplastics and plastic waste into the LCA framework. But that work is not sufficiently well developed for us to really be able to capture it at this stage. So we left it out because the results would be effectively meaningless. But I think that is an area that could be followed up on, you know, two, three years from now when the methods are better developed. Linked to that, though, we have a comment from um, Catherine, which I think is, is kind of relevant in this context, which is just that it might be useful to have a systematic study on the abrasion rates of different plastics used in the seafood sector. There's small projects being done, but nothing systematic at the moment. Uh, does anyone want to comment on that? Or should we just take that as noted? I, I think that's a that's a fair point um, and, a, and a sort of an area that um, that certainly we're you know looking into um, but I wouldn't restrict it just to the seafood sector I think all sources of plastics in the marine environment including those from land um, including you know outfalls and storm waters and and, and sort of discharges uh, would be worth looking at as well, um, both point source and more diffuse, you know, off roads um, and the likes. Uh, it's certainly, it, it is an emerging area of research as well, right? Uh, I know it's a, it's a you know, the, the standard methods and, and techniques and things are still being developed. So it is a, a challenging space, but I know one that uh, interest and efforts are being put into. So there was one last question I had, and that's what's next? So where do we go from here? Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think for aquaculture in New Zealand, um, it's it's about incorporating the life cycle um, assessment in a in a really practical and useful kind of tool um, and embedding it in our A plus program. So um, we're we're hoping to have, for example, it might be say like a LCA calculator, a simple a simple a um, couple of inputs that um, individuals or companies can have a play with and input and, and get, um, I think, a bit more of a responsive measure of um, to track their carbon footprint and, and potentially some, some other um, impacts over time. So we can also look at um, improvements over time. And we're also considering um, working with MPI and our New Zealand King Salmon farmers this year on a life cycle assessment for um, farmed King Salmon so that we have a complete picture of the, the three main species that we farm in New Zealand and, um, and areas to focus on in the future. Thank you, Steph. Anything from your side, Peter? Uh, I think the, the immediate um, sort of face for us is, is I guess, get through the, the challenge of the current situation with, with labour and uh, that's sort of been imposed on us and, and sort of be able to keep things going through that. That's the immediate. Um, looking further ahead, it's really investing into and planning around 
within our business, the reduction of emissions, you know, beyond what they are now along that pathway that we have for the uh, emissions reductions. Um, you know, we've, we've made some quite substantial goals and targets, set some ambitious targets for ourselves, and that really requires us to, to get in, um, you know, do some upgrades, gain efficiencies within uh, our own operations in a number of areas. So we're putting big effort into that. Sounds good. One question that just appeared might be relevant just in the relation of what's next is, will you be making any kind of claims, whether that's on the packaging or anywhere else as, as a result of this? Is there, is there any intention to do that from your side, Peter, or is it too early days to say? Uh, probably early days at the moment. We haven't uh, sort of specifically set any targets around that. Um, wouldn't rule it out, but uh, not on the short-term radar. Michelle? Yeah, that's the same, yeah, that's the same from Moana. It isn't, um, isn't currently on our radar, but just in terms of um, what next for Moana. So I've already um, mentioned that we are currently um, looking at our carbon reduction roadmap. Um, we've got a, a target of um, to be carbon neutral by 2040, and so absolute reductions is our first um, step. So that study helps, helps with that. Um, freight, because we've got um, currently live accounts for 20%, um, of our oyster sales, but that demand is growing, that um, you know, consumer demand is growing. And so we hope that that will help drive some um, research and innovation in the transportation space. Um, and then there's more for us to do around packaging, um, you know, poly bins and ice packs and poly bin liners, you know, all, that, all of those um, sorts of things. Uh, with that then, thank you all for your attendance. Thank you very much to our speakers and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks for dialing in. Appreciate all your time. Thank you. Bye.